Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, I'm your host, Simon. Welcome, welcome on this show. One of my writers, in this case, Matt, has written me a script, The Gainesville Ripper. Campus killer and inadvertent icon. Uh, <laughs> these are the sort of titles where it's, you know, uh, in the true Christ bro, so it's like, the legendary killer. And you're like, whoa. Legendary, I know, like, icon is neither, like, a positive or a negative word, but it is one of those words that's kind of, like, accidentally positive. Like, surprise. You're always like, oh, a nice surprise. And it's like, no, surprise is neutral. So that's interesting. Or, like, legend can be, like, Hitler was a legend. Like, in a good way, in a bad way. Like, he's a legendary man. There should be, like, words, like, you know, there's famous and infamous. There should be in legendary and stuff like that. Wait, is legendary positive? <laughs> It could be. Oh god, did I just call Hitler a legend? <laughs> there goes my monetization on YouTube. Uh, let's just jump in, shall we? Buckle up everyone, we're going on a trip. Today we're heading to beautiful Gainesville, Florida. The largest city in North Central Florida. And again, Matt. I feel like we better be getting a kickback from the Florida Department of Tourism for this one. A lovely and sunny city. Known for its support of the visual arts, it's undoubtedly one of the premier locations to visit. Should one make a trip down to the Sunshine State? Matt, I do genuinely believe sometimes that you are getting kickbacks from, like, different tourist departments. <laughs> we all on the hustle. Or maybe this place is just really nice and Matt's like, I just love it there. I just love it, Simon. Like... You know, the love for some of my sponsors. Vessies always come to mind. I tell my friends about Vessies. I'm not even paid to tell my friends about Vessies. They're just so good. Backblaze as well. Shaker and Spoon. Love those guys. It's also home to the University of Florida. Specifically, we're heading back to the year 1990, August of that year, and school is gearing up for a brand new semester. Oh, do you guys... I'm sorry to already be off on the tangent today, but you like I remember the end of summer holidays, and we had really long ass summer holidays. Like it doesn't seem like that long now I'm an adult, but we had like nine weeks of summer holiday every year, which is a lot. And that as August, the end of August comes around, you're like, oh no, I gotta go out to school on like Monday, September the third or whatever. You're like, oh, you're just dreading it. It's coming around. It's coming around. Nine weeks off. And then you get that new timetable. It's our double maths first thing on a Monday. Why, Lord? Why? Well, it's Sunday evening. Like, oh, God, school tomorrow. No. I think we all know the feeling of the start of school, the nerves, the jitters, but also the excitement, especially when it comes to university. Yeah, I'd look forward to going back to university because I lived by myself. I did what I want. I didn't have that heavy of a schedule. It was great. But school, less so. The feeling of independence, the feeling of freedom, going out on your own, living on campus, being responsible for your own life and your way of living, it's a wonderful time. And this was the reality for those moving into their new dorm rooms and apartments on August the 23rd, 1990 at the University of Florida. Two such students were 17-year-old Sonia Larson and Christina Powell. Both were freshmen, this day being their first on campus. They moved all of their things into their brand new apartments. Both were young and petite, both were beautiful with brown brown eyes and brunette hair. Remember that description, my friends, because uh, we're seeing a bit more of it today. That night, after a productive day of moving into their new home and excited for classes to start, their whole lives ahead of them and their dreams much closer to coming true, Sonia and Christina went to bed excited for the days to come. Going to bed and looking forward to what the next day will bring, looking forward to a future of their own making. It's a fantastic feeling. I think we can all understand. We never think it could all just end when we least expect it. I don't know, I feel like I'm a super morbid person because, I don't know, I think about death a lot. Like, probably, I mean, not just when I do these shows I, and not just, like, the death of other people, but also my own mortality. And it's like, you know, it can all just, like, end. You know, you read these stats and you're like, yeah, well, most people, you know, the average age is 80. But that means for every person who lives, like, 100, someone's popping off in their 30s. And that's scary. And I don't know, I've known a lot of people, like, people close to me have died, like, really young. And you're like, that, that's, you know, it really makes you think, oh my god, like, I don't know. <laughs> Matt's like, you never think it could all just end? And I'm like, I just live in a place where I'm like, I'm gonna die <laughs> young. <laughs> oh god. Don't die. Gainesville was a wonderful town. <laughs> Yeah, we know, Matt. I read your introductory paragraph. And the campus of the University of Florida had been called one of the best places to live in the entire nation by Money Magazine just days prior. Wait, university campus, one of the best places to live in the world? Like, I don't know. Like, the place I stayed at university was pretty nice. One of the best places to live in the world? Hell no. 
It was like university accommodation. It's not the Four Seasons. The people felt safe there. The students felt safe there. So much so that many of the students felt comfortable leaving their windows open at night for the nice cool breeze as the weather was rather warm. I just have to say, you've got to live in a strange place. You don't live in the nicest place in the nation. If you can't have your windows open at night when it's warm, you live in a bad neighborhood. Like, if you're scared of people breaking into your house at night while you're there, you you don't live in a good neighborhood. <laughs> you just don't. I've never even thought about not opening my windows at night. Why would I not do that? It is Florida after all, hot and sweaty 24-7. Sonia and Christina felt that way, and as Sonia went upstairs to bed and Christina crashed on the couch, they left their windows open just a crack to keep their new home nice and cool, perfect for someone to look in and see the beautiful occupants inside. Oh god. And just as they drifted off to the land of dreams, a nightmare came inside. In the early hours of August the 24th, the darkness forced open the door to their apartment with a screwdriver as the two teenagers slept soundly. With eyes filled with deviance and malice, he stood there in the living room, staring down at the sleeping Christina. The young woman was entirely unaware of the monster that had just broken into her home. With that, he left her there. For now, no. Instead, the shadow of death glided up the stairs and into the room of the sleeping Sonia. The poor girl was fast asleep, all the while her end had just entered the room. In one swift motion, the monster duct taped her mouth closed so that she would be unable to scream and proceeded to bind her as best he could. Sonia struggled as she awoke, fear gripping every inch of her being, but it was all futile. Her attacker was a large man, 6'2 in height, and he was strong. Her screams, silenced by the tape, he proceeded to stab her with a K-bar combat knife that he brought with him over and over again until she struggled no more. And unfortunately, he wasn't finished. The ghost then returned downstairs and to Christina, still asleep, still blissfully unaware that her friend and roommate had just left this world. Duct tape in her mouth and binding her arms behind her back as she awoke, he threatened her with a knife and cut her clothes off her body. With her screams muffled and unable to fight back, he raped young Christina right there in the living room of the home where she had so looked forward to living for the next several years, the place where all her dreams were supposed to start. Then, forcing her down onto the floor on her stomach, he brought his knife down several times into her back, until she too was no more. And even then, he wasn't done. The sick bastard still wasn't satisfied. The villain of our story made his way back upstairs to what was once Sonia Larson. The monstrous creature of a man had his way with what was left of her. He cut off her nipples as some sort of heinous trophy and then proceeded to take a shower as if this was just some normal night. Once he believed he was clean, despite being one of the vilest human beings I've ever come across, the ghost simply walked back downstairs, exited the apartment, making sure the door was locked behind him, and vanished into the black of the night, having begun the first two in a short string of murders that weekend that would put all of Florida in a panic. Jesus, Matt, we really jumped into it today, didn't we? No, I'm depressed. Like, it's just going from like, oh yeah, Gainesville. What a lovely place to live to be in like, and then he cut her nipples off. Holy sh**, dude. Jesus. As we watch him disappear and the images of what we just witnessed haunt our thoughts, I think back to when we traveled together through the terrible tale of Jack the Ripper. Ever since his reign of terror, many individuals have been given the label of the Ripper throughout the years, from Peter Sutcliffe to Andre Chikatilo. Each of them earned their label, and this one is no different. So now, as the abyss swallows us once more, I tell you his tale. A tale of abuse, of murder, of rape, robbery, and horror. This is the story of a man who shattered the tranquil fun within the city of Gainesville and put the entire country on notice. This is the tale of the Gainesville Ripper. Grizzly Gainesville the day started out the same as any other, the rest of the world unaware of the evil that had transpired hours earlier. The sun was shining, it was a beautiful day, and students were out and about on campus enjoying themselves. Everything was fantastic, except no one had seen two of the newest students. Where were Christina and Sonia? The next day, on the 25th, members of Christina's family arrived to help move in some new furniture for her and her new roommate. They knocked, but they received no answer at the door. They weren't the only ones, though, as several other students and friends had tried the same thing. No one could get in contact with the girls, and so they left notes for them on their door. Notes that they would never see. Christina's family were rightfully worried, so the next day they contacted the maintenance guy for their apartment, telling him to open the door. They opened the door into a living hell. The police were called immediately upon arriving. They saw the maintenance man running down the stairs and puking as soon as he made it to the bottom. 
Walking inside, officers found the brutally stabbed and mutilated bodies of Sonia and Christina. Blood was everywhere. Their clothes were torn to shreds, and the perpetrator had gone so far as to pose their nude bodies in sexually suggestive positions before taking his leave. To say fear gripped the campus of the university that morning would be an understatement. Word travels fast on a college campus, and soon it had spread through the whole school that two new students had been viciously killed in their apartment that night. With so many people coming onto campus as part of the new semester, people started wondering if maybe someone from the school had killed these poor girls. They didn't have long to ponder, though, as only two hours after the discovery of Christina and Sonia, another victim was found. I want to say it's probably not one of these new students, because... It feels, would you really go to a brand new place knowing nothing about the area and on your first day commit a double murder? I feel like you've got a lot going on. You've probably got a busy day. You're moving in. You might wait a week before you commit a double murder. I get the feeling it's someone who's on the campus and already knows the layout of the land a little bit. They're comfortable with the area, more comfortable than everyone else who's just moved in. This was 18-year-old Krista Hoyt. She was a lovely girl, beautiful, with full and lively brunette hair and deep brown eyes. Sound familiar? She was actually studying to be a member of the police force at the time and had a part-time job working at the local sheriff's office. She was actually meant to be at her job on that very day, so when she didn't show up for work, two officers were sent to check on her and see if she was okay, and that's when they found her. Krista was found in her room on her bed. Her body had been posed into a seated and slightly sexual position. She was naked with her clothes slashed away. She had been stabbed multiple times in the back, and her abdomen had been ripped from her pubic bone to her breastbone. Also, she had been beheaded. It didn't take long to find the head, though. As the officer walked into the room and found this grim and bloody sight, they turned around and came eye to eye with the decapitated head of Krista Hoyt, intentionally placed on the shelf facing her bed, her dull, lifeless eyes staring eerily down at her own body. The events went a little something like this. Hours after the killing of Christina and Sonia, the Ripper still hadn't been satisfied. He wanted more. On that same day, he found his way to Krista's apartment, and he used the screwdriver he had on hand to pry open the screen door. She wasn't there at the time, so instead of cutting his losses and calling it a day, the ghost of Gainesville simply sat down and waited in her living room for her to return home. She did so at around 11 that morning and was attacked from behind. She struggled for all she was worth, but the Ripper was strong and placed Krista in a chokehold. After she had been subdued, the killer duct taped her mouth and bound her limbs just like the others. Then he tossed her on the bed, slashed her clothes off with his knife and proceeded to rape her. He then forced her onto the floor in her stomach, just like Christina, and then stabbed her several times, killing her. Placing her on the bed, he then opened her up with his knife and left the scene. He later returned to Krista's apartment. We don't know why. What is known is that he thought it would be a fun little trick, since he was already there, to cut off the head at this point and to reposition the body into a seated position, placing her head on the shelf as if he wanted Krista to admire his grisly handiwork on her own body scream for me. By now, the news of the third victim had become public knowledge, and the campus was utterly petrified. There was a killer on the loose. Three young women were dead, and there were no real clues to go off. The police put out as much information as they believed necessary in order to hopefully get someone to come forward with any new leads or clues that they could use in their search for this monster. Meanwhile, students took extra precautions as the fear continued to build. They changed their daily routines, and many even started sleeping together in large groups for safety. Because the killings had occurred at the very start of the semester, there were even students who simply withdrew their enrollment at the university or took steps to transfer to a different school. Honestly, I can't say I, can, I blame them. Many had arrived excited to start their college career at their dream school, only for said dream to be torn away with the realization that a killer was at large at their school. Yeah, I remember my first week of university. We have something called Freshers' Week, which is where all the like 18-year-olds show up at university, and it's just a week before you have any classes or anything. And you just kind of get to know each other and party. It's a great time. And if there was a murderer, if people were murdered during that week, I'd be like, I'm in a bad horror film, and I'm going home. F*** this. That is so intense. I don't think there was anyone like how common is murder? I don't really know. That I don't I don't know of anyone who's ever been murdered. There was no one at university when I was there who was murdered. At least as far as there's a student newspaper, I feel like if someone was murdered, you'd know about it. Nothing like that. There were thousands and tens of thousands of students. So I don't know. Weird. All these steps, all these precautions, and it was all for naught. 
The Ripper struck again regardless, only two days after he stole the lives of Sonia, Christina, and Krista. It was on August the 27th, 1990, that the Ripper used the exact same method of a screwdriver to the sliding glass door to break into the apartment of Tracy Pauls and Manuel Manny Taboda. Manny was a former football player for Santa Fe College, so he was big and strong, not the typical victim type that the Ripper would have wanted. Regardless, he jumped Manny as he slept on the couch, and the two of them struggled before Manny was stabbed to death by the killer. Why is everyone sleeping on the couch at this university? So far, of the, like, the four people we've mentioned, Two of them have been sleeping on couches. What's up with that? Tracy, who heard the fight and came out to investigate, bolted into her room and barricaded the door. This didn't stop him, though, as he busted down the door and was on her in no time. Just as before, he bound and duct-taped her, destroyed her clothes, and then sexually assaulted her. Then, barely on the floor, he stabbed her three times in the back, claiming his fifth victim, before posing her body in a sexually suggestive possession and leaving. And to answer your question, yes. Tracy was a petite young white woman with dark eyes and brown hair, just like the other three. He didn't bother to pose Manny before making his exit, choosing to leave his body lying there in a pool of blood. I guess the sicko didn't get any sort of gratification from someone who managed to fight back. It's thought that he did not severely mutilate either of the bodies because the commotion caused by this attack might have attracted attention, so he felt rushed. Look at that. A serial killer who's also a coward. What a surprise. Yeah, not a surprise at all. What a piece of shit. The classic red herring. Now, dear listeners, you're probably thinking that feelings on campus had only gotten worse, and you'll be absolutely correct. Yes, this is there is a serial killer. How how quickly is this happening? When do you define a spree killer like someone who kills lots of people in a really short amount of time? Whatever this is, uh, at this point, I'd be like, I'm leaving. <laughs> this shit, it's not worth it. The level of panic had reached the stratosphere, and the students were more fearful than ever. Many students slept in shifts with each other so that someone was awake at all times. Some students carried weapons like baseball bats around with them. No one went anywhere alone during the day or night, and many double and triple locked their doors and windows. Yeah, I feel like this is like make sure you lock everything also this is america it's florida florida i feel like that's a country with loads of uh, a state with loads of guns get some guns this is why you know what's that second amendment for come on the first week after the murders all classes at the university were cancelled and by the end of august thousands of students left campus and simply 700 never came back because they feared for their lives that's so intense. The university's got to be like, oh, this is terrible for business. It didn't help that the police were an utter and utter loss from the start with no real evidence, nothing to go off or analyze of or any sort of clue. Now, Simon, I know you're probably thinking, what about the duct tape? Surely there were fingerprints or some sort of DNA that they could use to track down this freak. Normally, I'd say yes, if it wasn't for the fact that the Ripper was eerily good at covering his tracks. Oh. Wait, do we know who this is? Matt's not spoiled it, so we don't know if this guy ever gets caught. I mean, I don't, at least. Maybe you've heard of this case yeah so a criminal is actually surprisingly competent like normally it's like they, they just left dna everywhere because they're an idiot whereas this guy does seem to be doing some fairly like uh, fairly these are extremely violent crimes that would require a fair amount of exertion from him which i usually think okay that's gonna you know leave a DNA mark on a crime scene. We've become used to pretty dumb criminals on this channel. The smooth brains that leave evidence upon evidence at the scene of the crime. Exactly. The Gainesville Ripper? Not so much. The duct tape he had used on his victims, he made sure to take every bit of it with him and dispose of it accordingly so that fingerprints couldn't be collected. Any sort of physical evidence, like semen or DNA, well, he doused every victim that had raped in cleaning solvents to destroy any trace left behind. He was smart, and that only made him that much more dangerous and frightening. Is that, is that how easy it is to destroy DNA? Wow. I remember that episode of CSI where Greg, he's like demonstrating the luminol on like a thing. And he's like, look, look how much it makes the blood glow. And then he ends up, he's, it ends up destroying the DNA so they can't actually convict the person or something, which is, that's, that's kind of a bummer. Um, but I'm not sure if that's how it works in real life, although it does seem so. This is also the early 90s, right? So DNA technology is pretty early on. Yes, the police didn't have much to go on. However, they did have a likely suspect. This was Edward Lewis Humphrey, a 19-year-old University of Florida student who had a history of mental issues. Um, okay, so he's 19. He's probably been there already a year. He's not a freshman. So... Uh, he could fit the... Like, I don't think it's someone who just joined the university who's committing these crimes. I think it's someone who's been there a while. It also didn't help his cause that he'd suffered a series of facial injuries thanks to a car crash in the past, which left the lower half of his face covered in scars. If one were to think of what the stereotypical serial killer might look like, Ed Humphrey would come pretty close. Wait, why? Because he's got scars on his face? Uh, does that add up? I don't know. I've covered a bunch of serial killers. They don't tend to all have scars all over their faces, Matt. 
But okay. On August 30, 1990, with the fear of the Ripper in full swing, Edward was arrested for assaulting his grandmother he was living with. Charming. While in custody, he was questioned about the murders, and his erratic behavior did him no favors. On top of all of that, he was a manic depressive who at the time was off his meds and was constantly talking about Satan. He wore camouflage and openly carried knives, and had told many of his friends that he went on late-night missions through Alacqua County Woods. Jesus H. Christ, Ed, even I would think he did it. <laughs> yes. It's like some dude i don't know you get these like survivalist people who like wear too much camouflage and stuff there's a mason why we have this ongoing joke whenever we're like walking around or anywhere and we see someone wearing camouflage it's always like oh my god like say so he's wearing camouflage trousers you're like i can't see that guy's legs where are his legs <laughs> the camouflage is so good because wearing camouflage is a is a weird fashion choice fashion camouflage is not i don't know it looks weird why would you wear that it's amazingly effective though i remember at school i was in a play i can't remember what it was i was just playing like an extra or something it was it was a this like there was a senior play and i was like 12 or 13. and me and a mate of mine we were basically extras in the i think we had like two lines in this in this play but we were like military so we had these like fatigues is that what they call them camouflage fatigues like the army uniforms and so we were wearing these and this play would go on at night like it was on for several nights over a week and uh we'd have like two hours to just like mess around just backstage with nothing to do so we'd just go out and we'd run around the school grounds and this camouflage was insane it would just be i remember just being blown away by how effective camouflage was because my mate was standing in front of a bush right in front of me and i was like charles charles where are you and he's like mate i am right in front of you and i'm like whoa <laughs> I can't see you! Camouflage can be really effective, which, I mean, it's no, no surprise to anybody, but that kind of blew my mind. It basically made his body invisible. It's crazy. Fascinating story, Simon. Thank you. Ed Humphrey was held for five months on suspicion of being the man who claimed the lives of five victims, his bond being raised from its original $10,250 to insane million dollars. While the police tried to build a case against this pudgy, glassy-eyed outcast, where do people get a million dollars for bail from? I know you can have these companies that will, like, they'll match, like, if you give, like, 10% or whatever, then they'll um, cover the rest of it or something on, like, collateral or something. But most people don't have a million dollars in collateral or a million dollars any anywhere. Like, how are you supposed to afford that? The police thought it was him. The public thought it was him. But the proof simply wasn't there. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what people think. The police can think all they want. They have to gather evidence. The case was brought before a grand jury, and, and I recently learned grand jury isn't some sort of, like, super jury. It's the jury that gets to decide whether you actually go and see a regular jury. Like, grand jury sounds like the opposite, right? At least in my non-American mind. Like, grand jury should be, like, I know the, the Supreme Court doesn't have juries and whatever, but, like, they're, they're, if the Supreme Court had a jury, that would be, like, the Supreme Grand Jury or something. Not, like, the pre-jury jury. It was quickly thrown out, citing insufficient evidence, and Edward was released. The public was outraged. Ed's picture was shown countless times over those five months in relation to the killings, and the well had thoroughly been poisoned. Well, well done, everybody. If this guy's innocent, you've thoroughly made his life a misery. The police had to publicly announce that Edward had been completely cleared in an effort to calm the people, even though they themselves still had their eyes on him. Things truly were going nowhere, and the murderer was no closer to getting brought to justice. Wait, the police are like, okay, here's how we're going to calm everyone down. The guy that you definitely think did it, and we just don't have enough evidence for, we're releasing him, because uh, that'll calm everyone down. What the f***? It's not going to calm everyone down. It's going to make the situation much worse. That is until an unexpected link several states over horrified the authorities and made them realize the Ripper's body count was actually higher than they had previously thought. Death and Revelations in Shreveport after a couple of months chasing their tails and having their gaze fixed on Ed Humphrey, the Florida authorities got a call from an unlikely source on November the 4th, 1989. This was the Louisiana police, and after reviewing the graphic killings of the university students, they contacted the Florida police because they had a similar case one year ago in November of 1989, where three people were brutally killed all under the same roof several states away in Shreveport, Louisiana. This was 55-year-old William Grissom, his 24-year-old daughter Julie, and his 8-year-old grandson Sean. The three of them had been sitting down to have dinner that night when death walked through their door. An intruder had broken into the house, killed all three of them, clearly having no qualms about killing a defenseless young child. He raped Julie, killed her, brutalized her, including biting so hard into her skin to leave marks, and then he posed her on her bed with her legs spread. Sound familiar? Yes, it does. Why has there been such a long time? 
between these two things that was a year ago in 1989 and then he killed basically what was it five people four people in a week or whatever at that university what's he been up to in that time between i feel like this could probably been a lot of murders that need to be looked into someone needs to be searching that database for like uh murdered body sexual poses because do people like this just go quiet for like a year do they don mains an investigator on the case with the florida department of law enforcement traveled to shreveport to investigate the evidence from the grissom killings to see if it truly was similar to his own cases putting things under the microscope there was no doubt in his mind the posing was the same the use of tape was the same the method of killing was the same there was even the use of vinegar to attempt to clean the body of all evidence this was the ripper to a t almost a full year before his weekend of bloodshed down in gainesville there was however one major difference despite his best efforts he left dna behind bodily fluid was found on julia's corpse and after mains ran a number of tests on the sample it was discovered that the perp had b type b blood a true breakthrough they should definitely test it against that guy that they had um in custody what was his name ed humphrey they should definitely test him for that that same month after mains had returned to florida crime stoppers received a call this was shreveport city resident cindy juracic she had information about a possible subject in relation to the murders in both shreveport and gainesville you see she had met a rather odd individual while attending a louisiana hometown church a man who had said some pretty disturbing and out of place things to her and her husband at the time for a while the strange man would come over and spend time with the couple at their house that is until cindy's husband stephen had enough and told her that the man needed to go that he couldn't come around any longer <laughs> it's like i met a man at church he was saying all sorts of weird things so we had him around for dinner he continued to say weird shit. we had him around again eventually we had to ask him to leave <laughs> how many people is it you meet them for the first time they turn out to be weird and then it's like let's go let's go hang out never never i'm always like man i don't even remember people like that because i'm like oh i'm sure i just never thought about them again because i was like do you want to hang out with them no <laughs> no and it just turns into one of those random meetings that you've had with a person and then never thought about ever again what's going on with you when she asked him why he responded that the man had told her that he had a serious problem i said what kind of problem and stephen said he likes to stick knives into people oh my lord now i don't know about you guys but i wouldn't let him back into my house after saying that sh hell no it's like i like stabbing I, I like getting a little stabity stab stab and it's like, you're not coming around my house anymore bro no more sunday lunch for you cindy had dismissed these comments at first she simply didn't want to believe this man could be capable of something like that let alone be responsible for the awful murders in their city now i understand seeing the best in people i do that myself but good god woman the man admits to the feeling of enjoying stabbing people and you just let it go <laughs> regardless eventually the odd man left and she hadn't seen him for quite some time then while traveling through florida she caught wind of the killings at the university of florida along with their similarities to the killing of the grissoms the words of the drifter had haunted her ever since the news of the florida deaths fixed in her mind especially after something quite telling that the man had told her about a goal of his to quote one day i'm going to leave this town and i'm going to go where the girls are beautiful and i can just lay in the sun and watch beautiful women all day um that doesn't seem like so insane <laughs> that's a that's like i just want to go where there's beautiful girls and chill out on the beach it's very different to like i like to insert knives into people's bodies one is the sort of thing that someone says is like yeah the dream man i just want to go where the girls are it sounds like a beach boys song whereas like i want to insert knives into people's bodies sounds like something patrick bateman would say sounds like florida to me all this compounded on her until she finally gave in and contacted the authorities giving them a name looking into it the police actually managed to find this man very quickly he had already been arrested for the robbery of a supermarket in Acala, florida on september the 7th 1990 10 days after the bodies of pauls and taboda were discovered it was in january of 1991 that the authorities were able to track him down being held in the marion county jail 40 miles south of gainesville he was a tall man 6'2 with pale complexion receding black hair and downward slanting eyes this made it look as if he was eternal on the verge of crying and he had a pouting mouth to match they tested his blood and found it to be type b the same as the killer and who exactly was this demented drifter who looked to be the monster who had caused so much pain in two separate states danny rowling the ghost's face Daniel Howard Rowling was born on May the 26th, 1954, to Claudia and James Rowling in Shreveport, Louisiana. His mother, Claudia, was only 19 at the time of his birth, and his father, James, was a police officer, along with being a decorated veteran of the Korean War. Now, would it meet the story of a serial killer as we start checking off some tropes from our serial killer checklist? And boy, howdy! 
Did Danny have those checks in abundance? Here we go. First of all, James Rowling was not a troll of a man who would verbally and physically abuse Danny, Claudia, and Danny's little brother Kevin on a regular basis, sometimes for the most ridiculous and pointless reasons. And always remember, if you want the best chances of raising someone who grows up to be a piece of don't forget to abuse them. It's a really good way to ruin someone's life. The list of atrocities heaped upon Danny Rowling by his father is as tall as the Empire State Building. Apparently, this all started way back when Danny was only one years old and he didn't crawl properly. I'm not joking. At least on one occasion, he beat the tar out of Danny for breathing in a way he disliked. Who does that? He even reportedly told young Danny that he was unwanted from birth. So what a father. <laughs> Holy sh dude i remember my first kid couldn't crawl properly <laughs> so i beat them no no obviously not but they used to like they, they it took them so long to figure out that they could like raise their butt into the air and get up on their knees for the longest time they're just dragging themselves around by their hands like we have these like um it's not carpeted it's like uh what do you call it like parquet floor or like a wooden floor and they'd just be like dragging themselves around the back sliding while they're using their little arms like <laughs> yeah but th that that that's it then eventually they, they figure it out because they're a kid and it didn't stop there from handcuffing danny and having him arrested because he was embarrassed of him to beating danny's dog so badly that it died in the little boy's arms it was constant hell within the rolling household one that there seemed to be no escape from sure james admittedly suffered from the unfortunate combination of post-traumatic stress disorder and inherent mental illness but there's plenty of people who deal with similar issues and don't harm those that are they are meant to protect and love yeah look i get being in the korean war and shit it's probably not going to be a great time like being a veteran of a war and all of this is going to take its toll mentally but there's lots of people who are veterans of wars and they don't end up beating their children do they sadly old jim was a violent and temperamental man and in conjunction with his horrible issues it made for a toxic environment that danny had to endure claudia god bless her tried to escape she tried to leave on several occasions but each time she somehow made her way right back to james whether it was for the sake of her boys or the typical unfortunate nature of an abusive relationship it's honestly heartbreaking the daily beatings and pain took a terrible toll on claudia getting so bad that when danny failed the third grade for failure to attend too many times thanks to illness she had a nervous breakdown she was soon admitted to hospital after slashing her wrists in an attempt to end it all which only worsened danny's mental state the only way that danny managed to cope even in the slightest was through music when he was 11 he started playing guitar and singing hymn-like songs something he would do for the rest of his life by this time though his mother had attempted her suicide and danny turned to alcohol and drugs as a way to cope out of the box on the checklist marked off right there as he got older danny went to church he continued to play music he tried to hold down job after job he did everything he could to keep his fractured mind straight and not to act out his ever growing dark impulses eventually he enlisted in the air force after the navy rejected his application but that didn't last long as he quit due to his constant drug abuse i feel often this could be one of those turning points like where you've got person who's like brought up troubled environment and they leave and join the navy or whatever and it straightens them out and they learn self-discipline and then they go and become a productive member of society obviously obviously not the case here but i feel like you get these you get these turning points in life don't you these little decisions that you make and things that you do that alter your life forever like i think back on like not something as serious as that like to join the navy or not to join the navy or to end up like a psycho or not but there's like all these little things that you decide in life and it's like oh my god if i hadn't done that one little thing i'd be somewhere completely different which is just crazy i'd love to have some sort of machine that would allow you to view all the alternate lives that you could have lived normally we'd hear that after this latest failure he went right back home into the toxic cycle of pain and torment but i'll give him this much he still made an effort instead of going back to his parents rolling instead went to live with his grandfather he even managed to get married to a woman by the name of omela haoko with whom he had a daughter love has a healing effect on a lot of people but sadly danny wasn't one of them uh taylor's oldest time rolling proceeded to both physically and verbally abuse his wife and daughter the spitting image of his degenerate father it got so bad that a mother filed for divorce taking the step rowling's own mother was sadly unable to do after the divorce rowling spiraled already dealing with terrible thoughts and plagued with disturbed visions he took part in multiple robberies throughout the south as well as raped a woman who looked eerily like his ex-wife he landed in jail thanks to the robberies in 979 in jacksonville georgia though he was released shortly after he continued this pattern throughout the 1980s landing in and out of prison in both Alabama 
Alabama and Mississippi for armed robbery. Then, how many armed robberies are you going to go to prison before before they throw away the key? Then there's that thing in America where it's like, yo, three strikes, bitch, and then it's in prison forever, which I think was like misapplied. Isn't that like famously the one about the drugs? So I'd be like, why are you in jail for the rest of your life? Oh, yeah, no, I was smoking weed three times. You dealing weed? No, I was just smoking the weed. <laughs> but like, if you're doing armed robbery and rape, on the third time, I'm totally down with being like, yo, you committed your third armed robbery? You committed your third rape? You don't get f***ing out of prison, mate. You've, I mean, I get, let's say it's 10 years per pop and you're doing the third one. It's just like, let's just give you 50 years and be done with it because by that point you're old and you're just going to die in prison. Or just, this is Florida. They got the death penalty. <laughs> No, I don't think people should be put to death like that. But, like, you get what I'm saying, right? That's three strikes thing. There's something to that. Then in November 1989, he was back in Shreveport, where he was fired from his last job at a local restaurant. For whatever reason, that seemed to be the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. Something vital and fragile snapped deep within the mind of Danny Rowling, and it cost three people their lives that night. Oh my god. Oh, this is the Grissom murders. As the darkness settled around him, both literally and metaphorically, he came upon the house of William Grissom, and we know what happened from there. Rowling broke inside, murdered William and Sean, and raped, murdered, and mutilated Julia, posed her sexually, and then left. So this is just a random family. There was no... He didn't know them at all. That is the most psycho of killing. There's just no motive, other than like liking to kill. That's sick. The Ripper was born that night, and he wasn't done. Things were quiet for Rowling for several months after the slaughter of the Grissom family, and it wasn't until May of 1990 that things would escalate even further. It was then that whatever was attempting to hold the pieces of Danny Rowling together finally let go, and the madness took hold in full. Late one May night, Danny and his father got into a last fiery argument, and this time it ended much differently. In front of the rest of his family, Rowling pulled out a gun and blew a hole in his father's stomach before blasting him right in the head. I certainly don't condone anything like this, but Jesus fuck me sideways, can't say I don't get it. His father fell to the ground and, believing he had finally murdered the man who arguably made him the monster he was, he fled into the night. Shockingly, James Rowling actually survived this brutal attempt on his life. Oh my lord, why? This guy, I mean, I don't think... <laughs> he's an abusive parent and a piece of shit human being. Does he deserve to be murdered? No. Um, do I have less sympathy for him? Yes. Why does he have to be the one who survives? He was shot in the stomach and in the face. And this prick is the one that lives. Though he has left missing both an eye and an ear for his trouble. Maybe you shouldn't have beat him for breathing, mate. Yes. From there, Rowling fled to Georgia before finding himself all the way down in Florida. Before heading to Gainesville, Danny made a stop off in Sarasota, Florida, where he broke into the house of one Janet Frake, binding and gagging her before raping her, although he did spare her life. Unfortunately, we know how things go from there. He set up a campsite within the forest behind the University of Florida, and in the following days, he would go on to strike fear and panic into the hearts of the entire city, claiming the souls of five innocent students in the process. After the last murder, Rowling could feel the heat rising and decided to skip town. And from there, we find him in Acala, Florida, attempting to stick up a Winn-Dixie at gunpoint. What's a Winn-Dixie? Some sort of store? Crashing his getaway car, he was arrested for this boneheaded blunder, spending months in jail before being picked up by the Gainesville police. And the rest, as they say, is history. Oh, right, okay, because they found the guy and he was, in, he was already incarcerated, right? Not in my movie. While being held in Florida State Prison, Rowling seemed to be chomping at the bit to tell his story, so much so that he met up with a fellow inmate by the name of Bobby Lewis and told him pretty much everything, filled to the brim with details only the killer could know, and had him write letters to the cops as a way to confess through proxy, even though he planned to plead not guilty. If I was that dude, and I was in prison with that guy, I'd be like, Hey, hey, officer! <laughs> I need to speak to a lawyer, and I want one of those immunity things. <laughs> Immediately, let's go, I got valuable information. Let me out. Come on. Bobby was even there when Danny practically confessed to the authorities, basically being used by Rowling as a mouthpiece to speak on his crimes. But of course, he couldn't take full responsibility for his actions. No, no, no. He had to blame it on multiple personalities. And now everyone may collectively face palm. Yeah, multiple personalities are not... I mean, they are a thing. I think we did a video all about this. And it was like, okay, so it's, it's an incredibly rare thing. But what's not rare is people using it as an excuse to get out of committing horrible piece of shit people crimes. It's like, no, 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 I have 19 personalities and only one of them is an absolute 
piece of shit murderer. Yeah, Danny, sure you have multiple personalities, and I'm David Arquette. Rowling claimed that he had several people inside his head, each with their own purpose. There was Danny, the main personality, a nice guy. There was Yanad, literally just Danny spelled backwards, who was bad. And then there was Gemini, the evil one and the true killer behind all the murders, the one who'd made Danny do what he did. I can literally feel my blood boiling as I write this. First off, the police didn't buy a word of this, thank God. Second, this was literally the plot of The Exorcist 3. <laughs> <laughs> that exists, which just happened to be playing in the prison at the time. <laughs> Me? Jesus Christ, dude, come on, you small brain. And third, that me personally, that's Matt off script, has two very dear loved ones who themselves very much do have DID, Dissociative Identity Disorder, which is what multiple personalities are. Okay, so they, yeah, like I said, they're real, but mostly it's it's rare. We clearly know more about this condition now than we did, but still, to see some sick monster using a real disorder that people suffer from on a daily basis and try to get a grip on constantly turns my stomach. As Danny Rowling waited in prison, you wouldn't you know he found love on the outside? Yes, it's another one of those cases. This was a woman by the name of Sondra London, a true crime writer. I don't understand, like, why <laughs> you're a true crime writer. Like, as we said many times, I started doing the casual criminal since I don't believe in the death penalty, God no. And now I'm like, fry them all! Why is a true crime writer, like my loathing for criminals and the depravity of humanity and re realizing that has gone up? It's not like now I'm like, oh yeah, cr criminals, they're okay. I'm like, oh my God, no, they're really piece of shit with broken brains. Sonia London, what are you up to? Stop this. Sondra. Sorry, what sort of name is Sondra? You'd think someone who knows all about true crime would not get caught up in the web of a vicious spider like Danny Rowling, but no, they got engaged, and she would work with Rowling to write a book about him titled The Making of a Serial Killer, the true story of the Gainesville murders in the killer's own words. Okay. Maybe she's just a maybe she's not insane. Maybe she's just a really good journalist. Like, how are you gonna get the, an exclusive? I'm gonna marry the prick. If you did that, that's kind of a legendary move. Um and if you just like them because they're a serial killer, then you're broken as well. When it comes to Sondra, these are Rowling's own words. Sondra London is a colorful and bright woman, intelligent, talented, and it's a shame the way the media has bashed her as of late. She hasn't done anything to deserve that. Sondra is a worthy soul who only tries to bring the very best out of all she does. From the mouth of a snake, I suppose he would even serenade her while in court. It's enough to make your skin crawl. And I'm not totally sure she's all that innocent, since apparently she had multiple romantic relationships with other serial killers beside Rolling. Someone should probably keep an eye on her, just saying, I don't know, either that or she's an amazing journalist. <laughs> How many times have you married? Six times? How many times have you been to serial killers? Six times? How many books about the serial killers have you written? Six books? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not bad, Sandra. Not bad. You got a cold, cold heart. The trial of Danny Rowling began in February 1994, almost four years after his bloody streak of murder. Shockingly, Rowling pled guilty at the last minute, claiming he wanted to be a superstar a la Ted Bundy. However, the trial went on as scheduled, and for those thinking how unusual that is, well, I'm sure much to Simon's utter delight, this was because it was a death penalty case. We are in Florida, everybody. <laughs> A lot of the states where it's like, you just know they have the death. It's like, you know, you think of states like Massachusetts, probably no death penalty. Then you go to states like Florida, it's like, oh yeah, they, they probably got death penalty for like armed robbery down there. They're like, give him the needle! The trial lasted a month, and in 1994, Danny was found unanimously guilty. And in April, he was handed the sentence of death. Ye fucking ha! And the sentence was read out, rolling his head bowed as if in shame, his lip quivering as if holding back sobs, his small, almost eternally sad eyes brimming with tears. I guess it's true. Even monsters can cry. Yeah, because he's gonna die. A very long time from now, after the extensive appeals process has been worked out. After his sentence was given, Danny was allowed to address the court. There's much I'd like to say, Your Honor, about our world, my beliefs, and the destiny of man. Why the fuck do we give these pricks this opportunity? I'm just gonna read this through before I give this guy's words any more airtime, because fuck this guy. Blah, blah, blah. He says he regrets it. No one gives a shit. I'm not using your words because I don't... While the court thought it was good for you to be able to say, I disagree. Just kill him and get it over with. Danny Rollin, the Gainesville Ripper, sat on death row and exhausted all of his appeals up until October the 25th, 2006. It's 12 years later. That day, Danny was given a last meal of lobster tail served with drawn butter, butterfly shrimp and cocktail sauce, a baked potato with sour cream and butter, strawberry cheesecake and sweet tea. Son of a bitch. 
Now I'm hungry. 47 people, more than double the normal capacity, were crammed into the small room behind the glass window, awaiting the death of a monster. As Rowling was brought into the chamber and strapped in, he was asked if he had any final words. Instead, the 52-year-old killer of eight sang a hymn that lasts about five verses, a song he wrote himself. Even after the microphone was cut off, he continued to sing all the way to his final breath, as if what brought him even the smallest hint of peace and joy back when he was a boy was in essence his last escape as his life slipped away under the weight of the executioner's needle. Wrap up. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of our grim and grisly tale. As the darkness recedes and we emerge back into the sunlight, the tragedy of this whole case will likely stick with us for quite some time. This is a clear example of how a monster is made instead of born. Had he been brought into the world with a stable household and a family who loved him, he might have been a productive member of society, and the eight people whose lives were brutally stolen uh, would have continued to go about their days none the wiser. But sadly, that's not the reality we live in. Danny Rowling was a man with absolutely no chance. The instant he was born, his father made it so that there was no shot at any sort of normal life, and the ripples of his actions extended to every aspect of Danny's life, ruining him utterly and destroying his mind. It's no excuse for the destruction he caused and the lives he stole, but I'd say James Rowling is just as responsible for the deaths of those poor students and the unfortunate family as his monster of a son. However, there's one positive thing that Danny Rowling provided for the world. So, Simon, I'm sure you and a number of our listeners have been curious about the second half of the title of this episode, Inadvertent Icon. Right, oh yeah, of course, right from the beginning. What could he possibly mean? Well, for those eagle-eyed viewers, I've dropped little hints all throughout this script, some obvious and some not. But for those still confused, let me enlighten you. I'm still confused. What clues? I don't know anything. I'm, I'm, I'm too small brain. In the early 1990s, an aspiring writer by the name of Kevin Williamson was watching TV late at night when he came upon a documentary on good old Danny Rowling. It covered his crimes and his story as a whole, and it chilled Kevin to his core. At that moment, as the wind whistled through his home, he glanced over to his open window, imagining oh, what it must have been like, must have felt like, to have a monster slink on through and kill you without you knowing. In that moment, inspiration struck, and he got to writing. What he created was a script about an evil killer that went around a college campus killing students and the media outcry that it caused. Several changes and revisions ensued as he shopped it around to different directors and studios before it landed in the lap of none other than Wes Craven, creator of Freddy Krueger and A Nightmare on Elm Street. Everything came together in the perfect storm of horror in 1996 when a film was released that would help redefine horror to this day, a movie about a bunch of teens paralyzed in fear of a killer on the hunt for their lives, a killer wielding a large knife donned in a black hooded robe and his face hidden behind what is now an iconic white soulless mask with gaping shrieking ma mouth. This is Scream, isn't it? I've seen Scream. I was like, oh no, Matt's definitely going to mention a movie that I've never heard of, like, I've never, uh, that I've never seen. I've never seen A Nightmare on Elm Street. I always get it confused with A Nightmare Before Christmas. Christmas, which is obviously a really different movie. So, but I, I do know Scream. Yes, friends and neighbors, Danny Roll in the Gainesville Ripper was the inspiration for the global phenomenon that we know today as Scream. The film was a smash hit and spawned four successful sequels, the second actually taking place on a college campus, much like the gruesome killings that inspired it. It's unknown if Rowling was even aware that it had been the inspiration for such a successful franchise, but perhaps it's best he didn't. He doesn't deserve the recognition that the movies would give him. But regardless, as we sit together and process all of this, dear listeners, I once more want to take time to remember the victims of this horrible abomination on humanity. Sonia Larson, Christina Powell, Krista Hoyt, Tracy Pauls, Mana Taboda, William Grissom, Julia Grissom, Sean Grissom. These poor people were simply living their lives, unaware that a darkness was lurking nearby, wanting to end everything for them. The Grissoms did nothing wrong. They were simply spending a dinner together, good family time, and he ruined it. All five of the students in Gainesville had the rest of their lives ahead of them. Their aspirations and dreams well within reach as they wished to grow older and experience all that life could give them and he ruined it. Danny Rolling, the Gainesville Ripper, the killer of dreams and happiness, ruiner of lives. Ghostface or not, the victims are the ones who should be lifted up and remembered while he sinks deep into the abyss, only known to those who browse the annals of true crime in search of the worst monsters in our long and sordid history. In that vein, I ask, dear audience and dear Simon, that we look across the campus of the University of Florida to see the numerous memorials placed around the school in honor of those lost. Five trees were planted back in 1990 by the Mortarboard Senior Honor Society in memory of the five students lost, and the names of the five were painted on a wall of 34th Street, names which have been maintained to this day. These are just two examples of many that were put up to honor the names of those so cruelly stolen away by a sad, demented ghost who had only killed for his own twisted sense of power and satisfaction. Rolling might be gone, 
but if the memorials promise us anything, it's that in regard to the five young lives who were lost 32 years ago, Gainesville will never forget. Dismembered Appendices Number 1. During the chaos of the trial of her son, Claudia Rowling was given a phone interview about the killings, and the entire time James could be heard screaming to her from another room in the house. Yes, even after getting half his face blown off, that vile temperament still remained. There really is no teaching some people. Number two, a couple of Rolling songs are up on YouTube. Um No, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna talk about no, fuck that. Uh no, I think this guy should just be forgotten. I'm not gonna talk about his songs. I don't care. I don't care. Number three. The Scream franchise has gone on to be one of the most successful and beloved horror series of all time, despite its awful origins. There's been five films as of this time, and a sixth currently in production, along with a TV series that wasn't actually half bad. Known for its satirical approach to the traditional horror cliches and mannerisms, the series has grossed about $142 million across five films from 1996 to 2022. Number four. As I said, throughout this script, I left little hints about which film Rowling ended up influencing. Not in my movie, in reference to the last line said in the original film by Sidney Prescott, the main character of the Scream franchise, played by Neve Campbell. David Arquette, who I name-dropped at one point in my running joke, played a central part within the franchise as the character of Dewey Riley. And throughout the episode, I referred to Rowling as a ghost, and the title of one chapter is The Ghost's Face, in reference to the iconic killer Ghostface, the main villain of the films. Sometimes being a film nut has its benefits. And that's where we end today's episode. Thank you very much for listening, if you're listening as the pod- as a podcast. Uh, if you want to leave a review wherever you get your podcast, that would be amazing. Thank you. If you're watching on YouTube, thanks for being here. Subscribe, like, and I'll see you next time. 